The following is a chapter from my book, Sexual Trafficking of Children, where I discuss the dynamics of the pedophilic personality. It is a rather lengthy but comprehensive discussion of the motives, personality types, methods of seduction used etc. Additionally, you will find narratives of the predators interviewed during the research. Chapter 2 Pedophilia Interview from Al, a 41-year-old pedophile I've always had lots of adult friends, but I prefer the company of young boys. Sometimes it's hard to get close to them because their parents butt in. Until I got caught with Rob, a really nice kid, nobody ever suspected me. Not even my wife. They told me I need to change my behavior, my attitude towards sex with boys. There's nothing wrong with my attitude, but if changing it will keep me out of jail, okay. I'll go along with their program, but I still insist there's no harm being done. Ask Rob. He refused to cooperate with the police until his parents put a lot of pressure on him. We're still very good friends and I don't hold anything against him. End of interview. Few issues related to sexual trafficking in children incite as much debate as pedophilia. There is even widespread disagreement over the definition of pedophilia, its impact or relevance within the child sex markets, and the effectiveness of statutory penalties against it. For our purposes here, let us define pedophilia in layperson's terms as an adult sexual preference for, or attraction to, underage persons that is, a pedophile is a person who derives gratification from engaging in sexual activities with minors. In this chapter we examine the behavioral traits of pedophiles, victim and offender relationships, collecting of pornographic materials by pedophiles, pedophile organizations and publications, pedophile sex rings, and offender therapy. Evaluating behavior, the pedophile continuum. Constructing a classification scheme for pedophilia is difficult because there are so many different types of pedophile behavior. Relegating a particular behavior to any given classification can reduce a complex phenomenon to overly simplistic components, also, a restrictive typology may fail to account for the fine shadings and variations in sexual behavior that are common to pedophilia. Rather than attempt to calculate all the possible combinations of conduct, we advocate an alternative approach, the pedophile continuum. All conceivable variations of behavior exhibited by pedophiles are arranged along a line, one end of which represents the least severe, mildest forms of sexual attraction to minors, such as a fleeting, one-time erotic fantasy involving an underage female, while the other represents the multiple offender whose life revolves around the sexual victimization of minors. It should be possible to locate accurately most forms of sexual deviancy displayed toward children somewhere between these two extremes. Locating a specific incident on the continuum, of course, requires assessment of the aberrant behavior and its effects upon the victim. The following case provides an example of the diversity of pedophile behavior. Assessing the facts presented by the investigating officers in this case will enable one to estimate the location of the alleged offender on the pedophile continuum. The Self-Sacrificing Pediatrician In November 1984 a postal inspector notified us that a local doctor had been receiving child pornography from Denmark. The inspector said the physician had been formally warned by the post office about the illegality of importing kiddie porn into the United States. The doctor worked in a welfare clinic in a low-income section of town. A background check revealed that he had given up a lucrative private practice in New Hampshire to assume a position with the New Jersey Welfare Department. A 38-year-old white male, the suspect, alias Dr. Hayes, lived alone in a one-bedroom apartment. During the 16 months drive Hayes had worked American Samoa a pediatrician at the clinic, he had examined approximately 2,000 children for various ailments. Above his office door was a sign which proclaimed, I am the only house physician who examines children for lead poisoning, in an area where housing had been steadily deteriorating for years, it was not surprising that many mothers brought their children to Dr. Haves. Our first step was to build a case by setting up a sting-type operation with U.S. Customs officials, who were very interested in helping with the investigation. 
we took some of the confiscated literature and placed it in the doctor's post office box. We then requested a superior court judge to issue search warrants for Drive Hay's apartment and office. The judge was very impressed with our affidavit but refused to issue a search warrant. Of the suspect's home. He did authorize a search of the suspect's person and the office. Dr. Hayes picked up his mail, including the planted pornography. We then confronted him in his office, identified ourselves as police officers, and let him review the search warrant. We opened the material from his mailbox, which turned out to be about 33 by 5 inch glossy, borderless photographs of young boys in deviant sexual poses. When questioned about these photographs, Dr. Hayes stated that he had purchased them for research in the field of child abuse and sexual exploitation. I asked him if he was aware that importing child pornography was a federal offense, and he replied that the pictures were for medical purposes. Drive Hayes did agree to a polygraph test and a search of his apartment, which later uncovered pornographic photographs and periodicals and also sexual devices. The case was brought before the Atlantic County Prosecutor's Office, which advised us that all we had were postal violations and that we needed to build a stronger criminal case. After months of interviews, the problems of further investigation became insurmountable because of the inability of the juveniles involved to understand or testify as to what had taken place in the doctor's office. We wanted to place hidden video cameras in the office to observe the doctor's examination techniques, but the court refused our request. In the end, Dr. Hayes left our city. In this case, sexual desire dictated a career change which most individuals would view as a downward move. However, the doctor's new position assured him of a steady supply of child victims. This individual exploited his status as a physician and the repetitious nature of his offenses advanced him toward the more damaging end of the continuum. Behavioral Aspects of Pedophilia Although it is usually assumed that most pedophiles or child molesters are males, we have observed an increase in the number of recorded incidents involving female pedophiles. Their behavior has gone unrecognized probably because of inaccurate reporting of such cases, cultural resistance to the notion of women as child exploiters, and a lack of knowledge regarding the behavioral dynamics of female pedophilia. Another factor is the attitude of many people that it is acceptable for an adolescent male to acquire sexual experience with an adult female. In the following case we can recognize multiple levels of victimization, including pornography, bestiality, and molestation. The crimes were a blend of incestuous behavior and extrafamilial exploitation. The offenders were, with a few exceptions, adult females. When compared with other incidents involving female pedophiles brought to our attention, this is not an extreme case. Furthermore, it suggests that female pedophiles are as capable of sexually exploiting minors as male pedophiles. The Exploitive Mother In 1982, officers of the Special Investigation Division of the Tulsa Police Department arrested a woman, Ms. X, for prostitution. Ms. X was the proprietor of a brothel known as the Love Palace, which she operated and maintained from her residence. Also at the house was her 13-year-old son Clark, who was put into the custody of family friends during his mother's detention. In 1984, officers from the same division received an anonymous phone call. The caller claimed that a teenage boy was being photographed in the nude while being stimulated by a dog, and that he was being abused by customers of his mother, Ms. X, a prostitute. An immediate investigation began in response to the call. Bits and pieces of intelligence were gathered and reports compiled. After several months, investigators reached an impasse. From all outward appearances, there was no illegal activities taking place at the residence of Ms. X. As a result, the case was left open, pending further leads and additional intelligence. In 1986, investigators discovered that Clark, now 17 years old, had attempted to commit suicide. He refused to speak with the officers, who, acting on the advice of his physician, did not pursue the matter. Later that year Dark began counseling sessions at the hospital for depression. As part of the treatment program, his mother, Ms. X, 
also attended. After several sessions Clark was permitted to go home on weekend passes. Upon his return to the hospital it was observed that he had become even more depressed. During one of the counseling sessions, Ms. X arrived, bringing several pictures of Clark and several females in suggestive poses that had been taken in the course of his weekend leave. Writing on the pictures implied that Clark was allowed to be with the adult females as part of a birthday gift arranged by his mother. In a joint effort involving hospital officials, police officers, and state investigators for the Department of Human Services, more information was gathered and a case was prepared against Ms. X. Clark was taken into protective custody by the state. Using all of the information gathered since 1982, officers obtained a district court search warrant for Ms. X's home. Found during the search were several photo albums containing pictures of Clark and several other children in deviant, sexual poses. During a police interview, Ms. X refused to comment on many specific matters, but she stated that she had engaged in sexual relations with her son, adding, Is there nothing sacred between a mother and her son? Ms. X was committed to the state hospital for the criminally insane. Clark continues to receive extensive therapy. In the above example, the mother disregarded the psychological trauma she induced in her son. The offender perceived her conduct as acceptable and continued her deviant behavior despite outside interference. Even her son's continuing depression and attempted suicide proved ineffectual in bringing the abnormal behavior to an end. Ms. X's place on the continuum is determined by her persistence and her resistance to ending the damaging relationship. What is the essence? of the sexual attraction pedophiles feel for minors. Just as a normal heterosexual male would be hard-pressed to explain precisely why he is sexually drawn to females, there is no obvious answer to the question of why some adults prefer children. Individuals may know how they are likely to be sexually attracted or aroused, yet not understand why they discriminate in their preferences and reactions. Nevertheless, once we begin to understand the nature of a pedophile's sexual pathology, a certain logic DOES emerge regarding their behavior. However deviant the conduct may appear to others, it makes sense when viewed from the offender's perspective. First, this perspective is determined by the pedophile's own experiences and the ways in which he presents himself to the world. His relationships with other adults, sexual history, family background, personality type, and physical appearance each help to dictate the choice of victim, sexual activity to be pursued, and likelihood of repetition. Second, juxtaposed with the pedophile's life experiences and background is the victim's sexual history, or lack of one, the cohesiveness of the family unit, the child's personality and physical appearance. Gender and age also help determine what sexual activity the child may be persuaded to endure, as well as the intensity and length of the relationship. Third, it is important to understand that the actual sexual activity may be a long-term drama between two individuals or an episodic interlude between strangers, with variations depending on the above identified variables. Of equal importance to understanding of the pedophile's behavior is the fact that the type of sexual activity may vary from subtle seduction to outright assault of the victim. All too often a discussion of child molestation will focus on dramatic episodes perpetrated by the violent and habitual offender because many people believe that these are the characteristics of all pedophiles. However, implicit in our findings is the fact that pedophiles manifest varying pathologies. Indeed, a wide range of racial and occupational types are represented in pedophilia. The offender may be married, with children of his or her own, while maintaining a dual sex life involving adults and minors. The ability to ingratiate himself or herself with children means that the offender will always find a way to gain access to minors. This effort may entail sponsoring or working with groups and in activities catering to youths. The offender's interest in minors may be limited, in some situations, to sexual fantasies, but in most cases he or she typically collects adult and child pornography. Beyond the collecting of child pornography, traits of pedophiles are difficult to isolate. In fact, attempts to do so can raise more questions than they answer. For instance, 
is an adult male who uses a juvenile prostitute on the assumption she is an adult guilty of molestation? DOES an adult woman who finds a teenage male attractive fit somewhere on the continuum? What of the adult male who marries a minor? All of these and similar situations tend to weaken the value of standard, profiles, of child molesters. One example of the fallibility of stereotypes surrounding pedophilia is given by the following interview with Carl, a 24-year-old former school teacher who is currently serving a 20-year sentence for kidnapping. Carl has a history of multiple victimizations of adolescent males, including ongoing sexual relationships, assault, and blackmail. His case is a study of cause and effect. Note the amount of methodical planning and the manipulation of victims and the response of the criminal justice system that characterize his exploitive activities. The dialogue, stretching over a 10-hour period on several days, has been condensed into a series of highlighted topics, such as methods of operation, rationalizations, motivations behind behavior, and types of sexual activities. Carl the Kidnapper Den. How did you get here prison? What are your charges? Carl. I was home on a furlough from another institution. I committed a crime against a young man in the neighborhood and was charged with taking indecent liberties with a minor child and kidnapping. I received a sentence of 11 to 33 years. Dan. What was the nature of the act? Carl. The first charge was rectal sodomy. I accepted a plea which reduced rectal sodomy to indecent liberties, because it was a lesser charge. Dan. Can you briefly reconstruct the incident involving the minor? Carl. It was on a Sunday, no school, in the summertime. I asked this kid to show me where his school was. We got there and I offered him some money to show me where a certain part of his school was, an isolated area I knew about. We went there and he became nervous, said he was ready to leave. I held him, punched him in the nose, and had sex with him a few minutes later. Dan. All right, I get the picture. What got you to that spot on that particular day with that particular boy? Carl. I've been asked that question by a lot of people. You know, there is no real definition or reason why. The only thing I can say is that it was more or less a pattern of behavior. He wasn't the first victim, there was a wide range of victims in different areas. But it was one particular pattern where I approached the victim in a certain area, within one square mile of the school. I'd ask him to show me where a specific area of the school was and the acts were committed there. That was a pattern for over five years. Dan. But you got caught just for this one incident? Carl. Right. During the course of those five years there were a number of victims. Most of them were too frightened to tell anyone for whatever reason. No one ever investigated the other acts. Dan. Any other criminal charges that have occurred in your life? Carl. The only charges I've ever been convicted of were rape, indecent liberties, sodomy, kidnapping, and arson. All of the crimes I've been involved with, except arson, were against people my own age or younger. I got started at 14. Dan. How? Carl. I just used to go out in the neighborhood. When I'd see kids I'd just beat up on them for something to do. And then, you know, it came to my mind that maybe I could take them, use them for sexual purposes. After I was convicted of raping a girl, I went to a special hospital. There I was introduced to homosexuality by other boys. Dan. Well, that leads to the obvious question. How do you classify yourself now? Do you see yourself as a homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual? Carl. I would say bisexual. Dan. What about these other incidents involving kids for which you were never investigated that no one knew about? Carl. Approximately 20 others. Most of these acts were committed in the neighborhood within my ward. I guess the kids are too scared to tell anybody or just didn't know what was happening to them. Dan. I need those points clarified. 
What were your basal techniques for getting close to these boys? Carl. Offering money, I guess. The plan was not to give it to them to keep when it was over. See, I always had five dollars. I was spoiled and my mother always gave me what I wanted. Most young kids get fascinated with five dollars. So you just show it to him and he says, wow. How can I get that, that's all you had to do is show it to them or let them hold it and they'd be glad to take you anywhere you wanted to go. Dan. So, as you mentioned earlier, they would walk with you over to the school. What then? Carl. I pretended I was meeting someone there or didn't know my directions. After I got there I may tell the kid my friend said he was going to leave a briefcase for me in a very isolated area of the school, like the window well or basement. I just sent them down to look. When they go down I jump in after them and that's it. Most of the time it wasn't planned or premeditated, just a spur of the moment thing. Go around the neighborhood, see somebody, and say, I think I'll take him, when I was in the hospital or jail, I used to receive a furlough or home visit. So I went out and committed a crime each time. I once got a furlough for 12 days for Christmas vacation. It was about 8.30 in the evening and I was out walking the neighborhood, enjoying the snow cause the next day I was due back at the hospital. The street lights were on. As I was coming up Orchard Avenue, this particular kid got off the bus. He was standing there and when I walked past he asked how to get to Western Street. He had got off the bus at the wrong stop. So I said it was only a 10 or 15 minute walk and offered to show him the way. At the time it really wasn't in my mind to commit a crime. The street lights were out on the corner and I took him up to the school, the long way around. It was very quiet and nobody was around. We got to the window well, I got him down in it, and made him perform oral and rectal sodomy. Then I let him go. Dan. How did you feel after it was over? Carl. It wasn't happy, more like remorse. Each time I committed a crime I would check with a children's hospital, call in cause the police always take kids there. I would say my kid was assaulted. I wanted to know if my wife brought him there. I was always able to obtain a name and address from the kid when it happened, so I could pretend to be his father on the phone. That way the hospital would trust me enough to give me the facts. I did that only to see if I should disappear for a while or whether I could walk the streets without having to watch my back for the police. This way I could check to see if the kid reported the incident. Or, I'd call his house so I'd know for sure, tell the kid, you'd better not tell anybody or I'll kill you. I know where you go to school. Dan. Would you have carried out any of these threats? Carl. I doubt it, but I had lots of opportunities and came close to doing it once. Besides, I had friends in school who would take care of the kid for me if I asked them to. But, honestly, these kids trusted me. Like the judge said, the reason I'm giving you the time I'm sentencing you to is because you were always able to gain the trust of people, I had some kind of appeal to kids, I guess. Dan. One final question. By assaulting these kids, do you think you may have transformed at least one into a future child molester because of the experience? Do you see any connection? Carl. Yes. Either a future molester or homosexual prostitute. The reason I say that is because most of the homosexuals I've talked to in jail over the past five years tell me they were molested or somebody in the family did something to them sexually. When they are older, most of them will want to see what it's like for somebody else to be the victim, to use somebody who can't resist or doesn't know what you've got in mind for them until it's too late. Notwithstanding the difficulties mentioned previously, certain behavioral traits of a pedophile can be identified. For example, there is an extraordinarily high probability that the offender was sexually victimized as a minor. Often these individuals indicate that they feel alienated within the adult community. Carl's case also indicates that pedophilia can continue to victimize a person for a considerable period of time, and it makes the point that not all victims of exploitive episodes are identified. 
Victim Offender Relationships Identifying an ongoing exploitive relationship between a pedophile and a minor is a difficult task. The intense interplay of emotion between a victim and offender is often overlooked. There are however, certain signs of molestation. Because many of these warning signs are ambiguous and could reflect a variety of problems, the key is to look for a cluster of them. If several indicators are present, a pedophile probably has developed an exploitive relationship with the minor. Some of the more revealing indicators include the use of sexual jargon and sexual role-playing by the youth. Sexual acumen is a particularly accurate reflection of ongoing exploitation or intrafamilial abuse, as is extreme interest by the juvenile in being with a particular adult to the exclusion of other adults and youths or in spending an excessive amount of time at an adult's residence. Vague or evasive answers by the juvenile when questioned about the adult may also indicate an exploitive situation, particularly if the minor passionately defends an adult accused of wrongdoing or misconduct. In addition, signs of drug or alcohol use by the minor may be accompanied by such changes as loss of appetite, inability to sleep, or decline in academic performance. Further behavioral changes that may occur include loss of friends and frequent requests to stay overnight or spend weekends at the exploitive adult's home. The adult involved may discuss his or her child, friends, in terms normally reserved for intimate companions. Frequent use of the offender's residence by minors as a congregating site is a possible indication of exploitation. The adult may be willing even anxious to spend an inordinate amount of money on and time with a potential victim. The adult often acts as a surrogate parent by performing a multitude of mundane chores for a cleald, such as running errands or babysitting. Often a truly likable individual, the offender may express genuine interest in a juvenile's welfare, even to the point of displaying an abnormal amount of anguish or anger over prolonged absence or separation from the child. An adult minor relationship characterized by these basic warning signs may well be an exploitive situation. In the following case concerning a church accountant, the offender capitalized on the victim's naivete. The minor's desire to experiment sexually, as well as the offender's ability to manipulate circumstances, led in this case to their eventual involvement in a sexually exploitive situation. A repentant church accountant. These kids just kind of lived at my house, watching television, or maybe playing Atari games. I bought all of the latest cartridges for them. They were there, not at my request, but because I let them and they didn't have any other place to play in the neighborhood. They weren't at my house 24 hours a day, but if I was home they could come in any time, with their parents' permission, and play Atari. I enjoyed them being there, they were my friends. This sounds weird for a man 39 years old to say, but I've always been a loner, felt awkward around people my own age. Nothing in common. One day these two kids, ages 9 and 11, came by while I was outside sunbathing and asked to play Atari. A half hour later I went inside and found them in my bedroom, looking at Playboy, with a funny look on their faces as though they had been masturbating. It was no secret that I kept Playboy around the house. I also kept a lot of homosexual books locked away in a drawer. I went back outside after telling them not to look at the magazines. Here comes another boy, a 15-year-old. I didn't want him to go in the house and see them in there, so I kept him outside. We had done something sexually before, in the previous two, three weeks. It was a form of gratification for me and a way of giving him pleasure. He wanted to do it. He saw their bicycles and asked who was inside the house. I told him who and said they were looking at Playboy. He wanted to join them so we went inside the house. I told the two younger boys to leave because we wanted to look at the Playboy and take our clothes off. Thinking back on it, I really didn't want them to leave. It ended up that we all took off our clothes. We started masturbating ourselves and each other. Finally, it got to the point where we were stretching out on the bed and somebody said it looked like fun to give each other blowjobs. I remember having oral sex with the 15 year old and he did the same to me. The other two were having oral sex together on the floor. I had to leave the room because somebody knocked on the door. 
I threw my shorts on and answered the door. It was a mother who had come to get the 11-year-old. He left and one went back to the bedroom, where the remaining two were having oral sex together. That's all we did no anal sex. Also, one don't think anyone ejaculated. What one did was wrong because society's moral code says so, because it is against the law, and because I don't want any kid to turn out like me. One reason one let those kids look at the playboy was because, when I was growing up, my parents never talked to me about sex, I wanted these boys to have a healthy idea of what was involved. They wanted to do that stuff, I never forced anybody to do anything. Part of me feels it wasn't wrong and another part knows it was morally wrong. I never thought about doing something against the law. I would never have done anything to harm those children at all. Pornography Collections The single most distinctive characteristic of a habitual child molester is a compelling interest in collecting adult and child pornography, which can be a valuable source of evidence in the case-building process. The more sophisticated and elaborate a collection, the more probable an offender is involved in long-term, organized exploitation. In addition to pornography, a hardcore pedophile collector will often have in his or her possession a wide variety of erotica and related materials, the most important of which is a diary or journal which typically contains an extensive personal record of sexual experiences with minors. In addition, a pedophile may keep an address book, either on paper or on computer diskette, with the names and addresses of other pedophiles, victimized or targeted children, sources of pornography, local and international, and likely places for meeting children in other areas or cities. To supplement these materials, an offender typically stores personal correspondence from other pedophiles, pornography firms, and names of companies that cater to juvenile needs such as clothing, tickets for athletic events, and toys. A pedophile's collection of erotic paraphernalia may include a wide range of materials, from sexual devices to all types of adult and child pornography. The pornography is bought, sold, or traded by the offender. Photograph albums which contain both innocuous and pornographic pictures of underage victims are of special interest to pedophiles, as are stored, souvenirs, of an offender's actual or fantasized relationship with a minor, including undergarments, wallets, junior high and high school yearbooks, or ticket stubs from a children's play. The extent and composition of a pedophile's collection can reveal a great deal about his or her commitment to exploitation. To the pedophile, these possessions are comparable in value to family heirlooms, diaries, and life savings. Because youth is a transitory stage of development, a pedophile's record of sexual conquest serves as a permanent reminder of pleasurable occasions. It is not uncommon for a pedophile to operate a darkroom for processing photographs and films of minors. Processed slides, films, negatives, and videotapes are usually stored at the offender's home or at a secondary site such as a friend's residence, an office, or a rental locker. A collection, as described above, is one way a pedophile relates his experiences to others with the same sexual preference. More importantly it will enable the pedophile to show the victim what he wants to do with or to the child, while presenting evidence that other children perform similar acts. The pedophile described in the following case fits this profile. The florist. Mr. Trant is a white male in his early 40s with an exceptionally high IQ. An only child whose parents, alcoholic mother, were florists, Mr. Trant has a son and daughter by two marriages. He studied photography while serving in the army and later inherited his father's floral business. Mr. Trant claimed to have engaged in genital fondling with other children as early as age 5 or 6. He participated in various sexual encounters with adolescents from roughly age 10 into his late teens. In his early 20s he became a Boy Scout leader. Boys in his troop later admitted to having sexual relations with him. Mr. Trant admitted to sexual relationships with female adults and children during his adult years. He prefers the latter, stating that sex with kids is much easier than with an adult because children do not make value judgments. 
the offender became sexually involved with several children from poor families without a live-in father. The youths rode the school bus to a stop outside his flower shop. He would invite them into the shop and give them candy, money, and occasionally flowers for their mothers. Gradually, the children accepted Mr. Trant as a good friend. After gaining their trust, he eventually took them into the back of the shop. He initially took photographs of the kids with their clothes on. This later led to photograph sessions with them in the nude and progressed to specific sexual acts involving him with dry children. At the time of his arrest, mounds of pornographic literature were confiscated, including films and slides of his sexual activities with the kids and books on pedophilia. Mr. Trant was convicted of forcible sodomy and carnal knowledge of a minor. He received a 15-year sentence and was placed on active probation, with counseling required. Two weeks after sentencing, Trant molested his six-year-old son and the paper boy. Probation revoked, he was sent to prison and released in 1981 on active probation. In 1983 he was again arrested for performing sexual acts with minors and returned to prison, where he remains to this day. When asked about his intense sexual desire for children, Trant replied that the only real harm is that it is against the law. He believes it is a normal, healthy attraction. Methods of Operation The process by which a minor is manipulated into a state of victimization is known as a method of operation. During the course of conversations with various types of pedophiles, we compiled a fairly standard set of operating methods. Although some offenders did not admit to premeditation in their activities, an examination of their experiences reveals that they did indeed influence the conditions and circumstances that led to an exploitive situation. Reconnaissance, is one of the first steps in seeking out a victim. In order to acquire a, feel, for an area, a pedophile may perform a careful surveillance of neighborhoods. Places of interest include daycare centers, parks, playgrounds, apartment complexes, shopping malls, roller skating rinks, arcade game rooms, and recreational centers. One of the easiest ways to discover where a particular child lives is to discreetly follow his or her school bus. Infiltration, entails moving into a neighborhood or a specific section of a community where, based on the outcome of preliminary surveillance, the pedophile's prospects of encountering children are high. The emphasis at this point is on ensuring both availability of victims and opportunities to meet and engage them in conversation without arousing suspicion. Over the course of several months, an offender may develop friendships with parents and their children. He will strive to promote a reputation for himself as a trustworthy, reliable person. At the community level, a molester joins child-oriented groups as well as civic or religious agencies with youthful members. To establish a reputation as an adult who cares for children, the aggressive pedophile will seek employment or volunteer work that results in close contact with youths for example, as a daycare worker, a child photographer a pediatrician, or a foster parent. The lesson here is that all occupations which involve adult child contact should require pre-employment screening and background checks of applicants. Once his reputation has been established, the child molester will begin to wean children away from their families or friends through a variety of methods. Bestowing special favors on a child lures or bribes is a powerful enticement and a preliminary step in creating a dependency relationship. In so doing, the offender presents himself to a victim as someone who is truly a supportive, non-judgmental friend. This tactic is especially effective with minors in disruptive or abusive families. Another technique is to permit juveniles to enjoy greater freedom and liberties, such as smoking and drinking, than their parents would normally allow. The minor who participates in these forbidden pleasures has entered into an implicit bond of agreement with the molester that such activities are best kept secret from parents and other adults in order to avoid punishment. At this stage of complicity, the offender gradually introduces the topic of sex to the victim by showing erotic magazines or films. The friendship is upheld through gifts of money, and the ties between offender and victim become stronger. After adequate preparation, the offender begins to initiate some type of sexual contact with the child. This may start with a simple kiss or caress, 
then progress gradually to masturbation and finally to unrestrained sex with the adult and other youths. All the time the pedophile keeps working at lowering the victim's innate resistance and inhibitions toward sex through alcohol, pornography, and value replacement. To avoid exposure, the molester will bond his underage victims to him by threats, by displays of affection and rewards, by warnings of future punishment from the child's parents, and by making the victim feel responsible and guilty for what has happened. In other words, the pedophile may seek to transfer blame onto the victim. One very effective method for accomplishing this end is to take pornographic photographs of the child and use them for blackmail. If the molester is ambitious enough, he may decide to broaden the scope of his exploitation to include recruitment. That is, he may be able to persuade his victims to recruit other minors into the relationship on the premise that these children are entitled to, join in the fun, recruitment is always a necessity, because a pedophile's interest in a specific victim dissipates with time. Although some offenders maintain long-term relationships with their victims, usually out of convenience, they constantly seek new targets upon which to focus their attention. Eventually, a victim is discarded to be replaced by another. Not all hardcore pedophiles, however, are so circuitous in their efforts to seek new victims. Some take a more direct approach for instance, offering to babysit for neighborhood parents. Others marry a divorced mother with children, molest the minors, and then either divorce the mother or abandon the family. And, of course, there are those prone to violence as in Carl's case, who prowl communities, randomly select an underage victim, and commit some type of sexual assault. Their method of operation is based on force, bribes and lures, or misrepresentations such as asking for directions or assistance or posing as an authority figure or friend of the family. The following case illustrates the persistence of pedophiles and the efforts they are willing to make to exploit minors. It involves an individual who successfully convinced other adults and minors, through phone calls, to perform acts of sexual exploitation. Detective Michael Keller, the case investigator, explains how the police became aware of this activity. Trafficking by phone On January 11, 1985, I was contacted by Sue, a mother of two young boys. She reported receiving two phone calls from a man who called himself Tom. During the first call, Sue stayed on the line because the conversation sounded like a unique sales pitch. Ten minutes into the dialogue she realized he was not a salesperson and that, in fact, something strange was going on. She encouraged Tom to call again in order to get the police involved. In the second conversation the caller became more explicit and promoted the sexual exploitation of children, he indicated he would call back the following week. I installed a self-activated recording device on the phone on January 15 and notified the telephone company to institute a computer trace on all calls. That same day Sue called to tell me Tom had contacted her again. I retrieved the tape and reviewed its contents. The following day I was advised by the telephone company of a successful tap and trace. Our suspect lived in an apartment, and a check of his lease agreement verified his identity. By February 13, approximately 10 hours of taped conversations between Tom and Sue had been collected. The most frustrating aspect of this investigation was that I could not come up with a suitable charge except telephone harassment which is a class B misdemeanor and punishable in Texas by six months in jail and slash or up to a $1,000 fine. However, it was found that his attempts to persuade the complainant to become sexually involved with her two boys constituted criminal solicitation for aggravated sexual assault of a child. Criminal solicitation is a second-degree felony punishable by 2 to 20 years in prison and a fine of up to $10,000. A search of Tom's residence yielded the predictable share of adult and child pornography. More importantly, we discovered a ledger of approximately 3,000 phone numbers the suspect had called. Beside many of the numbers were various descriptions and a code. When Tom called and received, for example, a favorable response worth a follow-up call, he put the word, Sam, beside the number. At the start of a return call he would ask for Sam. 
This allowed the recipient the option of not talking by saying that no one by that name was there. He was apparently quite successful, as indicated by the volume of phone numbers with the word, Sam, beside them. Pedophiles like Tom who do not wish to have physical contact with an underage victim are nonetheless capable of promoting sexual exploitation of children by telephone, through computer bulletin boards, and through the mails. A similar case involved a Midwestern school teacher who called approximately 100 adolescent males and offered to arrange a sexual rendezvous for them with adult women. After discussing masturbation and genital size with the adolescent, the teacher promised the youth that he would receive payment from an adult woman in exchange for sexual services. He would instruct a potential victim to wait at a specific time and place for the arrival of a female, customer. The customers were fictitious, but the teacher would become excited greater than observing the adolescent, from a safe distance, waiting for his liaison with an adult female. The teacher was eventually charged and convicted of promoting the prostitution of a minor. As in the case of Tom, there was no evidence to show that the teacher had ever had physical contact with a victim. Pedophile organizations and publications Organizations and publications that advocate adult child sex are relatively few in number but are catered throughout the world. They perform an assortment of functions and exist for the following purposes. 1. To recruit and expedite the exchange of information and correspondence among pedophiles. 2. To act as a medium for advertisers and distributors of softcore child pornography. 3 to promote political activism and organization. 4. To alert members or subscribers to recent court decisions and active criminal investigations. 5. To provide a bulletin board news service as to the whereabouts of sexually available minors. 6. To raise funds for legal representation of accused pedophiles. 7. To offer sexual stimulation in the form of erotic fiction or suggestive photographs of minors. All of these organizations and publications strive to justify and rationalize the illegal behavior of their members or readership. One, for example, is the North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMBLA. This organization advocates the cause of adult males to have sexual and emotional relationships with underage males. NAMBLA has chapters in Boston, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Toronto, with an active membership between 500 and 1,000. NAMBLA publishes a bulletin 10 times a year, an annual journal, and various miscellaneous booklets on the subject of intergenerational relationships. The bulletins contain information about pending legislation, judicial investigations, and, boys in the media, along with essays, poems, short stories, photographs, and occasional sketches of adolescent males. NAMBLA has a steering committee, five national chapters, and a handful of spokespersons. A prisoner support committee corresponds with convicted boy lovers and offers limited funds for legal aid. NAMBLA's philosophy distinguishes between molestation and man-boy love. Member believe that children and adults can have satisfying emotional and sexual relationships based on consent, that physical intimacy is not bound by age limits, and that minors therefore have the right to select intimate adult companions. An adult male who is attracted to an underage male is, they say, entitled to establish a nurturing relationship based on mutual trust and respect. What is ignored in this particular argument is the question of whether a minor is capable of giving consent, they simply assume that children understand exactly what they are consenting to when they enter into an extraordinarily complex, potentially damaging relationship with a seductive adult. Another such organization is the Lewis Carroll Collectors Guild. According to its newsletter, Wonderland, which is printed four times a year, the Lewis Carroll Guild is, a voluntary association of persons who believe nudist materials are a constitutionally protected expression and whose collecting interests include preteen nudes. Wonderland is a collection of articles and advertisements, both domestic and international, that promote interest in photographs, artwork, and articles pertaining to nude children on the premise that no exploitation is involved. We have no information about the subscription or membership size of the Guild or its newsletter. The Pedophile Information Exchange, 
Magpie, is based in Great Britain. Its publication, known as Magpie, seeks to provide pedophiles with their own journal and tries to further the understanding and acceptance of true love for children in today's society, at one time Pi printed a limited edition publication entitled Contact which contained the letters of pedophiles from the Magpie subscription rolls. Although Pi has been hard pressed by the British judicial system, its membership is unknown. Its principal goals, however, have been to lobby for revised child sex legislation and to coordinate its resources and efforts with other pedophile groups in Western Europe. The Diaper Pale fraternity allegedly consists of a group of indeterminate size that advocates sexual relations with minors, particularly prepubertal children and infants. It reportedly produced a publication, Bedtime Stories, which discussed such topics as the use of hypnosis to seduce minors and the variety of sexual activities possible with an adolescent. Based in the Netherlands, Spartacus is a publishing firm that specializes in printed materials for homosexuals and pedophiles. It distributes materials for the pedophile market under the name Colts Foot Press. Pedo Alert News, a glossy black and white magazine, is available through Colts Foot Press, it contains international news, erotic fiction, and updates on the status of pedophiles. Colts Foot Press sells a variety of books and collections emphasizing man-boy sexual relationships. None of these publications contains any graphic photographs of nude adolescent males. Group de Recherche pour un enfance différent, GRED, is a French pedophile support group that began in 1979. In 1982, when it hosted its first national conference in Paris, with four representatives of Pi in attendance, the organization claimed an enrollment of 70 members. GRED is composed of five regional groups, overseen by an executive committee and assisted by technical commissions or work groups. Its publication is called Les Pet e Credin. GRED claims to serve as a lobby group whose purpose is to effect legislative and social changes for the sexual liberation of youths. Reality and Boy Love are two underground, mimeographed newsletters printed in the United States. Because both are produced in the same city. It is likely they originate from the same individuals. Reality and Boy Love preach that existing legislation regarding age of consent is unfair to adults. Moreover, the writers of these amateurish newsletters argue through essays, poems, and biased documentation that, same gender-oriented relationships, are natural and exist throughout the animal kingdom. Signa de Piste is a publication that contributes peripherally to the pedophile lifestyle. Published in Canada, it is a collection of outdoor photographs of adolescent males in shorts and swimming suits, accompanied by articles on the activities of boys. For a brief period of national media coverage, Tim O'Hara, spokesman for the Rene Guyon Society, advanced the belief that children starting at infancy desire and need sex with adults and other children in order to lead healthy and happy lives. The media's attention to the Guyon Society beliefs was due to the society's motto, sex before eight or else it's too late, although O'Hara's attempts to promote child adult sex have proved to be highly transitory, his ability to capture national media coverage for his cause is noteworthy. By publicizing their identities and philosophies, members of these organizations and editors of these publications have made themselves vulnerable to investigation. An underlying belief shared by such groups is that theirs is a persecuted cause that is not fairly represented in the laws or understood by society. By defining their conduct as, different, rather than immoral or harmful, they hope to achieve some measure of legitimacy in a sexually diverse society. The arguments they use to defend their position are intelligent and persuasive, but the facts often are adjusted to fit the circumstances of their activities. At odds with society's taboo against sexual relations with a minor, such groups struggle to survive on shoestring budgets, wavering memberships, and the constant scrutiny of law enforcement authorities. Sex Rings in the context of exploitation of children, a sex ring can be defined as a situation in which one or more adults conspire and organize for the purpose of promoting illicit sexual acts with and among minors. These acts include the production of pornography, prostitution, adult molestation of children, the sale and transportation of minors for sexual purposes, 
the use of juveniles to recruit other youths into the ring, and the use of blackmail, deception, threats, peer pressure, or force to coerce or intimidate children into sexual activity. Some researchers have developed criteria to explain the dynamics of this phenomenon. Point 9. The following elements seem common to all rings. 1. A high level of planning and cooperation among offenders. 2. Multiplicity of victims. 3. Longevity of the group. 4. Victimization of minors by other children. 5. Extensive range and sophistication of sexual activities. And 6. The potential to spill over into the public domain of exploitation, as in the sale of child pornography. An adult acting alone or in collusion with others may exploit dozens of children for decades, thus spawning a new generation of future offenders. The following three cases illustrate, in varying proportions, many of the principal characteristics of sex rings. The first of these, lover's part, describes a self-contained, exploitive group of adults who molested underage males exclusively for their own sexual gratification. Lover's part. A 13-year-old male had a lover's quarrel with his 45-year-old legal guardian. The child gave a friend over 75 pornographic photographs depicting numerous children having sex with other youths and adults. The friend turned the photographs over to the police, who began an investigation. Neither of the two officers assigned to the case had prior experience with sex ring offenses. The investigation lasted 36 days, with 555 man who was expended. No other officers were allocated to the case, which proceeded through the following steps. Stage 1. Physical evidence was collected, interviews were conducted, and search warrants were served at the offenders' homes. Stage 2. A total of 39 felony warrants and 41 misdemeanor warrants were delivered. Stage 3. Case preparation prior to prosecution lasted three months as the investigators attempted to follow multiple lines of inquiry. Stage 4 Five adults were convicted in one jurisdiction and three adults in another. One adult was not convicted. The average sentence was four to ten months in the county jail. This case was an investigation of the activities of six adults with three boys and three girls during a party that took place one weekend in July. As the police probe into the lifestyles of the offenders became more meticulous, a host of unanticipated facts began to emerge. As many as 100 or 200 juveniles may have been involved in the sex ring, which lasted about a decade. One of the adults, exhibited a pronounced sadomasochistic fetish. Behind a false wall in his closet he kept a complete stockpile of sadomasochistic equipment, and he had built a torture chamber in his bedroom, complete with electronic locks, shackles on the walls and ceilings, makeshift soundproofing, and sexual devices. The purpose of these elaborate measures was to permit the offender to engage in deviant acts such as whipping, genital torture, and bestiality with underage males. Besides researching his activities on film and cassette tape and through sketches, he also drafted an instructional manual complete with drawings and suggestions on the subject of sadomasochistic sex acts with minors. The following is an excerpt from his observations on bondage. The victim should be nude and helpless, tied or chained by the arms, legs, cock and balls, sometimes by the neck. Tight ropes or chains should be used so that they sink into the flesh, causing pain. He should be spread-eagled, his arms and legs stretched until he feels as if he is going to split apart. No matter where the torture is to take place, it should be in a concealed and secluded spot where the slave's cries and screams cannot be heard. If in the home, the radio or TV can be turned up to drown out the noise. The fundamental obstacles in this investigation were the difficulty of establishing rapport with the underage victims, hostility and lack of cooperation from their parents, and pressure from departmental authorities to close the case. Furthermore, due to the extreme nature of the sexual activities and ignorance as to how to present a case of this sort in open court, the prosecutor did not encourage the investigators to broaden the scope of their inquiries. Dozens of underage males and females were recruited for this ring with the lure of alcohol, drugs, parties, and experimental sex. With conditioning and persistent seduction, 
these juveniles subsequently became recruiters themselves in what is known as the spiraling effect of sex rings. The more active a ring becomes, the broader based are its membership and activities, extending outward and growing in size and sophistication. If the investigating officers had not successfully intercepted this particular conspiracy, there is every reason to suspect that it would still be in operation. Another ring involved an official of the criminal justice system who misused his position of authority. He did so in order to achieve sexual satisfaction through the molestation of minors and the production of child pornography. The Sheriff's Victims In a rural Midwest town, a sheriff had an unwritten policy among jail personnel that only he would supervise the showering of all new inmates, without the presence of other guards. Using the excuse of checking for lice, the sheriff ordered male prisoners, including juveniles, to apply soap to their genitalia until they experienced an erection. To those he liked, the young and frail, the sheriff made homosexual advances, promising in return an early release or a position as a trustee, which is associated with special privileges in the jail. These trustee privileges for victims included new clothes for school, paid for by the sheriff, placement in the work release program, trips with the sheriff outside the jail to pornographic movie theaters, extra visitation privileges, and unlimited access to a new color television provided by the sheriff. All of these favors were bestowed on male juveniles, six of whom testified, in exchange for the following activities. 1. Inmate 4 related that the sheriff had fondled him and had made inmate 3 perform oral sex on him while the sheriff watched. Also, inmate 4 was solicited by the sheriff to pose for pornographic pictures displaying various sexual acts. 2. Inmate 6 stated that he was given a shower by the sheriff, who told him to play with himself until he had an erection. He claimed to have been masturbated on numerous occasions by the sheriff in addition to having to perform oral sex. 3. Inmates 1 and 2 described frequent incidents wherein the sheriff engaged in oral sex and pornographic shooting sessions with them. Inmate 2 further stated that he participated in these various acts because the sheriff told him he was a personal friend of the judge and could therefore help or hurt the minor in court. All six inmates claimed that the various sexual acts they committed were involuntary, performed because they felt something had to be done in order for them to survive in the jail. They considered their predicament the result of the position of power held by the sheriff, and they feared the consequences of non-compliance. The type of crime committed or the past criminal record of the prisoner had little weight in the sheriff's decision regarding who would receive the desired status of trustee, body type was the determinant. According to the investigators, all of the victims were young, frail, and skinny. The sheriff offered protection for these underage inmates by placing them in a cell located in an isolated section of the jail, away from other prisoners. Maintaining an outward appearance of respectability, the sheriff had the advantage of being a member of the local law enforcement community. A state Supreme Court of Appeals appointed a judge to preside over the case outside the sheriff's jurisdiction. The assistant attorney general who was assigned to the case as prosecutor requested that the judges prohibit the sheriff from entering the jail during the investigation. The prosecutor wanted the sheriff suspended because he might impede the investigation by intimidating the young inmates, complainants, still incarcerated in the jail. To show proof of the extent of the sheriff's sexual involvement, over 100 pictures depicting pornographic poses of the inmates allegedly taken by the sheriff were presented to the judges. Both judges refused to examine the photographs, claiming they should not interfere with the office of the sheriff in the execution of his duties. Charges against the sheriff could have resulted in a maximum prison sentence of 56 years and $115,000 in fines. Instead, the 39-year-old father of three children reached an agreement with the court. The sentence stipulated his immediate resignation, 10 years of probation, and the requirement that he refrain from any employment related to law enforcement and remove himself from any situation involving inmates, children, or incompetent individuals. A final condition of the sentencing agreement required the former sheriff to seek psychiatric treatment. This sentence was handed down approximately six months after the local court allowed him to continue at his post as sheriff and 
warden of the jail, during which time he had free and ready access to the victims as well as to other incoming prisoners. The final sex ring case involves a mixture of profit and sexual pleasure motives associated with commercial trafficking. A child sex ring, whose operation spanned decades and involved over 20 victims, was uncovered through a seven-month investigation by Detective George Harrelson of the Tulsa Police Department. A Sting Operation The key suspect, Gene Smith, was first identified through an undercover investigation in July 1984. Detective Harrelson began corresponding with Smith through the mail, by September, they had progressed to telephone conversations. The suspect was unaware of Haralson's status as a police officer. The phone calls were placed to the detective from payphones in the Houston, Texas area. The topics of conversation included Smith's sexual activities with young girls and photographs he had taken of children in various states of undress. Detective Harrelson recorded each phone call and continued to build a case plea on the suspect. Houston police detectives were kept abreast of the investigation. In January 1985 Smith suggested that the two men meet on a weekend in Houston. Smith stated that he could arrange for the detective to meet a 12-year-old girl, known only as Jennifer. He described the girl as, money-hungry, because he had to spend money on her each time they had sexual relations. With this thought in mind, he suggested that Harrelson bring cash with him for this purpose, as well as a camera and, condoms and that good type of grease. A weekend date and location for the rendezvous was arranged. Several weeks later Harrelson checked into a Houston motel. Smith called to assure him that he would bring two young girls and a boy. Harrelson waited for Smith while Houston detectives monitored the proceedings from a nearby room in the same motel. When Smith arrived at the motel room with a young boy, a 10-year-old girl, and a 12-year-old girl, he made it clear that both of the girls would be available for sexual purposes. The girls were instructed to bathe, and while they were doing so, Smith gave the detective explicit instructions regarding the sexual activities that would occur. At that point, Houston officers entered the room and placed Smith under arrest for promoting child prostitution, promoting child pornography, indecent liberties with a child, and sexual assault of a child. From information gathered after Smith's arrest, Houston detectives pieced together the sordid story of a sex ring of adult males who photographed and sexually molested young victims, buying their silence with gifts of money or merchandise. Seven other child molesters were arrested in conjunction with Smith's sex ring. Over 20 victims were identified, some of whom had been sexually molested over an extended period. All of the girls, ranging in age from 8 to 13, came from a small, poor town outside Houston where the residents commonly lived in campers, tents, and trailers. Prosecution of these offenders continued as this book went to press. Offender Treatment Can pedophilia be cured? It depends, in part, on the extent of the pedophile's involvement in exploitation. As a general rule the answer is no. Pedophilia in its extreme or persistent forms cannot be cured, only treated. To successfully cure a pedophile requires a fundamental restructuring of his or her sexual identity and the subsequent reordering of sexual desires and attitudes that are often resistant to change. Several basic treatment options are available, including the following. 1. Psychotherapy, changed behavior through introspection, 2. Behavior modification that seeks to remove desire through a variety of aversion therapies, including electric shocks, induced vomiting, sensory deprivation, and compulsory masturbation, 3. Surgery, removal of the testes, 4. Medication for example, Depoprovera, which reduces an adult sex drive to that of an 11 or 12 year old, 5. Combinations of behavior modification and medication, and 6. Incarceration, with periodic counseling. None of these options can be considered a cure or provide permanent relief to a pedophile. They are merely stopgap measures intended to alleviate the symptoms. One treatment program that attempts to help an offender gain control over his or her behavior is known as, Together We Can, 
In the following interview the program director discussed many of the critical problems confronting pedophile therapy. This particular program is a variation of introspective therapy which measures success however relative or transitory in terms of the willingness of clients to radically reconstruct their sexual orientation. Together we can. Question. What is the general orientation or philosophy of your treatment program? Answer. The basis of the entire program is that molestation is not a sexual dysfunction, rather it is a newer dysfunction. And to mistake it for a sexually oriented dysfunction is wrong. What you often hear child molesters say is, I prefer kids. I prefer the company of kids. I feel more comfortable with kids, what they really mean is that they have not gotten to the point where they feel equal to adults. When they're interacting with age mates, they feel powerless and generally inadequate. But with kids they clearly have the upper hand. What we call the erection and ejaculation part of the abuse is nothing more than icing on the cake. It is not their primary motivation, which is to feel powerful. We have people in this program who are attorneys, businessmen, and other people who seem in the day-to-day -day work world to have prestige, and who function well in positions of responsibility, yet they become child molesters. We have found a positive relationship between being a child molester and being the victim of molestation while growing up. The basis of the problem is that most of our society's children are not taught to be in touch with how they feel. Let's take a molester who was victimized as a child. What happens is that the child turns to the molester out of loneliness and desperation. The molester can function as a very important person in the child's life. From the child's viewpoint, someone has taken the time to get to know him, to care for him, and, to listen to what he has to say. Question. Can you describe the seduction process? Answer. Usually the seduction, or setup, of the child takes place over a period of time so that the victim is drawn in and trusts completely and values the person's company above all others. When the abuse begins, the first feeling my clients have is one of total fear. Here's this trusted adult who is saying to the child that there's nothing to be afraid of, this is how people show they love one another. This is love, this is ours and no one will ruin it if we don't tell anybody. Typically it's not violent in nature, although as the relationship goes on and the kid begins to grow, remarks are made like, it would kill your mother if she found out, or, if you tell anyone you will get into big trouble. Finally it may end with actual threats or acted out forms of violence. When a child molester says to his victim, there's nothing to be afraid of, that's the beginning of a schism within that child. He ceases to be a total person and comes to be completely out of touch with feelings. Question. Because of the trust that has been established by the molester? Answer. Right. The sex offender wants to create the pleasant physical sensation. He does not want to scare or hurt the child, because that will interfere with further access to the victim. The child will become afraid, won't want to be around, and might tell. As times goes on, the child gets to the point which I call the moment of recognition of betrayal. Most of the victims I've worked with can pinpoint that moment. When they, victims, discover, usually between ages 10 to 13, that this doesn't happen to everyone, that it isn't okay, and that society has a nasty word for it, you would think the child might tell. But remember that tool number one was put into place a long time ago, pleasant physical sensation. A child who uncovers the betrayal also learns that people will not respond very favorably to disclosure. Also, after the initial shock of recognition that, I've been lied to by someone who has functioned as the most important person in my life, comes the acknowledgement that the experience felt good. That dilemma becomes a real source of guilt. He or she may go to the offender and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I know it's wrong now, the molester will say, well, you liked it as much as I did, that fact creates a feeling of guilt in the victim. Consider, finally, what this experience has taught the child. If someone is bigger, smarter, and stronger, they can do to and with you whatever they choose. Question. Is that the lesson a molester has learned? 
Answer. Yes. Now you have a child who has grown up feeling powerless, used, and generally out of control of whatever happens to him or her. And of course all this leads to extremely low feelings of self-esteem. The most important thing to remember about a child molester is that, at the moment of confrontation when his power base is threatened by the victim who doesn't want to be touched anymore, he begins to realize what he has risked for this power. Question. How does this relate to a feeling of power? Answer. When his power is threatened, he becomes more abusive in an overt way, although I don't think there is anything more abusive than the subtle ties of sexual exploitation. A kid who is in touch with his feelings and who knows how to express his feelings makes a lousy victim. So the most important thing, from the molester's viewpoint, is to make sure the victim never gets a sense of autonomy or self-worth. By the time victims reach adulthood, they are completely split off from who they are. All they know is when they were little, they were totally powerless to change anything that happened to them. They go through life thinking they're less than other people, even though the offender has been out of their lives for years. The depth of destruction is incredible. It's interesting to match an offender's method of operation against that used by the person who molested him as a child. It's very likely going to be almost exactly the same. Question. In other words, they are just repeating what happened to them? Answer. Yes. In their minds, the time they felt most powerless was when someone molested them. They learned that by molesting, they can feel powerful. We realize now that the molester will search for a while, maybe resort to drink, use drugs, or push his wife around even though she's an adult and doesn't make a good victim. Yet nothing makes those powerless base feelings go away. How can you get more power than you can have over a child? Total manipulation, total dependence, it's an incredible high. You can make that child do anything you want, anything, if done subtly enough and in the name of love. Also, the sexual acts are going to become more intense, particularly if the offender was himself victimized at an early age like 5 or 6. What this means is that the longer a sex offender remains at large, the more out of control or into obsessive compulsion that person is and the more intense or violent his acts are likely to become. One of the things that has drawn some of our clients into the program, without being court ordered, was their recognition that they could kill their victim. That's the ultimate power trip. When I read in the paper where a father killed his whole family and turned the gun on himself, I believe that what happened was a child getting close to disclosure. Rather than have that occur, the father commits this ultimate power act and blows everybody away. Question. So that principle of power forms the basis of your treatment? Answer. Control in this program is a positive thing. I call control self-worth, one thing I know is that no one who enters this program is in control. Question. Of themselves, their behavior patterns, their everyday living? Answer. Right. This is the first thing I tell people when they come here. Feelings are. They are not right or wrong, they just are. But we all know there are feelings we're told we should not have. When her feelings intensify, they create a tension we call powerless base feelings. The molester will do anything to relieve the tension. Something has to be done inside. We make our clients look at how they set the whole thing up, going back two or three years before they actually lashed out. One client felt really frustrated and powerless over a bad marriage. At his job he was very successful, made a lot of money, but he didn't think he deserved it. He hadn't gone to college. He was molested at age 6 by a man who lived on his street. Now, as an offender, he explained his method of operation. Kids were always at his home. He would play ball, wrestle with them, fix their bikes. He made his son's friends feel real comfortable at his home. His wife and son were out of town once while some neighborhood kids came by to play. One of the kids got wet and he sent the boy upstairs to dry off. He appeared in the room when the kid was naked. Apparently he started to set up the situation several years before the incident. 
By making friends with the boy's parents he made himself available. He knew this particular boy was lonely and that his home life was barren. By paying attention to and playing with the boy, at the time of the molesting act he knew he had total control or power over the victim. Question. Where is the treatment in your program? Answer. First of all we give our clients calendars on which they write and begin to identify their feelings. One feeling they can identify right from the start is anger I'm pissed off. A common feeling in the beginning. Many also can identify loneliness. Once we identify feelings we begin to learn how to get control over our reactions to them. If someone has a lifetime behind him of automatically blocking a feeling, it is going to take a long time to get to the point where he is aware of what he is feeling. Question. How do you bring them to understand what they are feeling through dialogue or group therapy? Answer. Through group and individualized sessions, and we also give homework assignments. Like keeping a feeling calendar. We ask them to write how they felt during any particular day and what occurred during the day that gave rise to that specific feeling and how they responded to it. That way we can break down all of it feelings, thoughts, and actions. We also require that everyone attend both individual and group therapy. During the individual sessions we concentrate on specific behavior, actions, and feelings. In group, I'll often have someone talk about an event which occurred when that person was clearly out of control. But keep in mind they are good con artists. Some of these guys have been committing sex offenses for 20 years or longer and never got caught. During the beginning part of the program, we make every guy get up and do his line in detail. A line is how he set it up, what his method of operation is. That's a hard thing to do. We ask them to begin two to five years prior to the offense, where the buildup of powerless base feelings began. The interesting thing is that the longer the abuse, the more intricate the line becomes. Question. What do you know to be common characteristics? Answer. These are people who feel horrible about who they are. That's the most important thing people should know. And out of the need to feel more powerful, they subjugate the person who is the easiest to subjugate. If I feel small, weak, and stupid and I want to feel the opposite, the most logical choice is a child. Question. Then what do you really do to change them? Answer. We offer people alternatives. Life is not just being a victim or victimizer. And that's how it's perceived by our clients at first. They see it as a, they get me or I get them, situation. We provide them with a third alternative, control. We provide them with tools they can use in order to live a life of control. We tell these guys there is no cure for what you have, there's only control. It's up to you. You pick up these tools and decide whether or not to be in control. Question. What is your method of teaching them control? Answer. We try to hit people on as many levels as we can. Part of the healing process is the group work. I don't think you can do the necessary amount of therapy with a sex offender if you don't have that person in a group, because so many things happen in a group. Denials fall apart on a group level. You can look at other people and see that they are succeeding. You can look at other people and say, this is really a nice guy and he molested a child, so maybe I'm not completely awful. Maybe I have a chance to. Question. This is where some experts would disagree with you. They see it as sex drive, whereas you see it as a power-based problem. Answer. Some people do. There are certainly different schools of thought. I have a guy who is 23 years old and was ordered by the court to Johns Hopkins for Depo Provera treatment. He said it helped initially, but the level they went with him was not too deep. He learned some ways to interrupt fantasy. He was a compulsive masturbator and discovered ways to avoid situations that were potentially dangerous for him. But I don't think they got to the root of the problem, which is how lousy he feels about himself. Since he's been here, I've seen him change for the better. As he gets down in there and identifies the reasons for his feelings, it's clear his past behavior has always been in the driver's seat. Question. 
What kind of success which I realize is a very relative word have you had in the seven years that you have been working with pedophiles? Answer. Sex offenders should be monitored closely for at least three to five years after therapy. But to be honest, I don't know what they do after they leave our program. The people who leave here usually do so when their parole or probation is up. The really committed clients, those who know there is no cure and feel our program is a good support system, return even when their legal obligation is long past. These guys, I believe, make it. Question. So you're basically a court-ordered program? Answer. Yes, for the most part right now, although more people are coming in on their own. Question. What kind of obstacles do you run into most often in dealing with this type of individual? Answer. The obsession compulsion behavior is really a very difficult thing to beat. The problem is that it takes time to rebuild self-esteem in my clients. Only with time DOES the program work. Conclusion. The real-life situations presented in this chapter demonstrate the wide variety of pedophilic expression and how resistant pedophiles are to easy classification. These cases reveal a great deal about the pedophile's method of operation and value system. A committed child molester is not deterred by statutory prohibitions, cultural inhibitions, or broader ethical questions regarding victim rights. Pedophilia is a sexual preference that, in its persistent state, cannot be completely cured without resorting to extreme measures such as massive sedation, hormone, adjustment, with depoprovera, or castration. These steps, moreover, simply eliminate the sex drive rather than supplant it with a more acceptable alternative. Wherever minors are found, so also are pedophiles. We have examined cases, for example, of molesters who victimized children at summer camps, gymnastic schools, beauty pageants, for minors, cheerleader and baton twirler camps and contests, church outings, hospitals, daycare centers, Sunday school classes, marching band concerts, public beaches, swimming pools, children's theaters, juvenile correctional facilities, sporting events, and circuses. Not a complete list by any means but an accurate sampling of the diversity of settings in which pedophiles have exploited minors. Pedophilia is the bulwark of sexual trafficking in children, for without this consumer interest in gratification at a minor's expense there would be no child sex markets. By merely incarcerating some offenders or providing some type of treatment for them, we fail to address the fundamental question of why such behavior is so prevalent. Perhaps the most promising answer lies in the realization that most offenders were themselves once victims. With every exploitive act, a new generation of offenders is spawned. In that sense, pedophilia may be considered co antagonist. Pedophilia is an issue of immense cultural significance, yet at the present level of public debate it is not likely to be seriously examined. Fostered by many factors in our unsettled and ambivalent social framework especially in the area of differing sexual values pedophilia continues to be an illegal, self-perpetuating activity that is frequently misunderstood, often overlooked, and invariably dramatic in its effects on the victims. End notes. Source. Detectives Ron Lane and Larry Ross, Atlantic City Police Department, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Source. Detective Sergeant George Harrelson, Tulsa Police Department, Tulsa, Oklahoma. For a comprehensive overview of the basic literature regarding the sexual pathology of pedophiles, see the selected readings section of this book. Source. Detective John Cox, North Charleston, South Carolina. Source. Lieutenant Thelma Milgren, Whiteville County Sheriff's Department, Whiteville, Virginia. Source. Detective Michael Keller, Missouri City Police Department, Missouri City, Texas. Wonderland, Newsletter of the Lewis Ken Oil Collectors Guild, No. 11, Fall 1985, Chicago, Illinois. Magpie, Journal of the Pedophile Information Exchange, Vol. 17, Spring 1982. One of the more complete reviews of sex ring types is provided by N.W. Burgess and Marianne L. Clark, 
eds. Child Pornography and Sex Rings, Lexington, Massachusetts. D.C. Heath, 1984. Source. Detective John Cox, North Charleston, South Carolina. Source. Detective's identity withheld by request. Source. Detective Sergeant George Harrelson, Tulsa Police Department, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Source. Chris Corbett, Senior Counselor, Together We Can, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania.